Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome back to another episode of the Modern Bar Cart Podcast. I'm your host, Modern Bar Cart CEO Eric Koslick. Thanks for joining us for another interview episode where we break down the tools and techniques that make great cocktails and great home bartenders. Recently, we've been talking with a lot of industry experts from distillers to bartenders from Philadelphia to Los Angeles. So this week, I thought we'd bring things home, figuratively speaking. Not home to DC, where Modern Bar Cart's based, but back to home bartenders, since home bartenders are the listeners and lifeblood of this show. This time around, I got to sit down with Sam Vieira, who's a really excellent home bartender based in the LA area. He emailed the podcast a while back and helped point us in the direction of some of our awesome LA adventures that we've been publishing recently. So after my trip to the Spirit Guide Society with Pedro Shanahan and after my tour of Lost Spirits Distillery with Brian Davis, I had the chance to catch up with Sam in person at one of his favorite bars and talk shop. But since Sam and I conduct this interview with drinks in hand, I think it would be kind of rude of us not to give you the chance to make yourself a drink. This week's featured cocktail is the Vesper Martini, which is a drink that figures prominently in this episode. Now, the Vesper is, of course, in the Martini family, and it's somewhat controversial because it's inevitably affiliated with James Bond and his shaken, not stirred mantra, which immediately alienates and inflames martini purists. And if you've ever had the misfortune of dealing with a martini snob, they're a very special brand of snooty, so watch out. Nonetheless, we'll give the Vesper cocktail its due because it also happens to be perhaps my favorite martini variation. To make one, you'll need three ounces of gin, I like a London dry style, or at the very least, something with a decent amount of juniper. One ounce of vodka, and one half ounce of Lille Blanc, which is a sweet, mellow aperitif from France. Now, if you want to get real fancy, you can also add in a couple dashes of lavender bitters that just mesh really well with the lemon twist garnish, which we'll discuss in a bit. When I do that, I really like using our embitterment lavender bitters, but hey, you do you. Now, as you may have noticed, this is a rather large boozy drink. We're talking like four and a half ounces of just booze. This eclipses even Negroni levels. So when I make my Vespers, I usually try to tone things down to around two ounces of gin, three quarters of an ounce of vodka, and then keep the Lille Blanc somewhere in the one quarter to one half ounce range. To round out our Vesper commentary, we've got one controversial issue and one sort of universal constant. Now, the controversy with this drink is, of course, whether to shake it or stir it. And I think this tension exists mostly because Ian Fleming's James Bond is a bit of an untrustworthy narrator, or put differently, he's not an expert mixologist. He's just kind of into booze. So what do we do here? I mean, do we follow the spy's instructions and shake, or do we kind of pat him on the head and tell him to focus on saving the world while the adults run the bar? Most experts agree that a spirit-forward cocktail like this should be stirred. But I'll put myself in Mr. Bond's corner and say, I like when a Vesper is shaken. I like the ice chips and the little extra bit of dilution it creates. But across the board, everyone seems to agree on one thing. The best garnish for a Vesper is a big, generous lemon twist. Extra points in my book if you express and discard that lemon twist and then take out your channel knife and make a long, thin garnish that lives in the glass with the drink. So, now that you're a little shaken and thoroughly vespered, let's return to this awesome conversation with home bartender Sam Vieira. Some of the things he and I discuss during the interview include how Sam made his way to spirits and cocktails via the wide world of fermented beverages, even dipping his toes into brewing. Which experiments, bottles, and equipment buys made the greatest impacts on his home cocktail game early on? Best practices for cobbler shaker and Boston shaker, usage, maintenance, and safety. 
the record keeping practice that Sam developed first on paper and then in the digital space to help build his cocktail repertoire and expand his library of flavors and recipes. A few tips on taking your tasting notes game to the next level, what to drink with Wilford Brimley of Walker, Texas Ranger fame, and much, much more. This episode was recorded at a really cool bar in Burbank called Guildhall. And in next week's episode, we're going to learn a lot more about how cocktails and esports go together. But I just wanted to give a quick thank you to Chris Olds and the other folks at Guildhall for hosting us that rainy afternoon and also for having a fantastic food and cocktail program. And with that, I hope you enjoy this wide ranging cocktail foundations interview with home bartender and cocktail enthusiast Sam Vieira. Sam, thanks for being on the podcast. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. So you are responsible for a couple of great interviews that we've already done. You you kind of, uh, you pinged me a couple months back and said, hey, you know, um, like in the podcast, we'd love to get some West Coast content featured. And it just so happened that I had a, a trip planned and, and you were able to make some great recommendations. So thank you, first of all, for that. And um, can you just introduce yourself to our listeners? Sure. My name is Sam Vieira. I uh, live here in Burbank, California, just north of L.A., and I have a passion for malted barley drinks like whiskey and beer, (laughs) and I have turned that into a love for cocktails that uh, has been growing, well, kind of exponentially ever since I kind of discovered what you could do with something like a bottle of whiskey and a piece of citrus fruit or something like that. It's amazing the places you can go. Sure, sure. And you are not a bartender by trade, correct? That is correct. No, I just do this in my spare time. I found myself hanging out at a lot of bars, and it's kind of what you do when you reach the appropriate age here in LA. Sure. (laughs) And uh, a lot of people go out, but I never have worked in the industry itself. I just sort of do this as a passion. It's like a side project. Sort of like my way of being creative at home. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. So give me a little bit more of like an in-depth history. When did you first start and you can even you can even begin with like the the beer side of things because I feel like that's a you know the ferment beer and wine tend to be the way that people make their way to spirits and mixed drinks. So give us a little bit more of a play by play with your journey and and how you got here. Maybe if there are some particular bottles or cocktails that you know got you into it. Let's talk about those. Sure. Early on, I can go way back. My I, I mentioned this to you before. My uh, Family was not really <laughs> one into the cocktail scene. If we had cocktails at home, they were highballs, and they weren't very good highballs. It was usually just cheap booze and 7-Up, uh-huh. and so that's how my mom made those things. Uh, but they did also make their own flavored vodkas. They So in Portuguese, I grew up in a Portuguese household. In Portuguese, we call this agua ardente, which is the strong water, <laughs> yeah. or the ardent water. Yes. And uh, usually it was just a bottle of vodka with like a bunch of cinnamon sticks in it and sugar, or anise is another one, which is anise. They put these anise root into there, and that would uh, infuse its flavor into that. I never liked any of this stuff. Like, I couldn't stand it. And it's amazing. I came to alcohol at any point in time. It took me years. I think I was probably 25 or 26, well past the age of reasonable drinking, before I started to discover wine, which my parents had had wine, but it was always cheap jug wine. You know, Carlo Rossi, Franzia, and it was served at the table every day. When you're drinking it every day, you don't, you know, you don't put a lot of money into it. Right. So I had cheap wine growing up. Didn't like any of it kept away from it well i discovered a uh, a frenchman in uh ventura county who was transplant here he grows his own grapes and buys some and he makes these french style wines that are phenomenal and i thought oh that's what wine is supposed to take like so i moved from wine uh, started going to a lot of wineries tasting a bunch of different stuff and developing my palate started with the light and sweet stuff gradually made my way to the dry dark red stuff and uh, really found it enjoyable and i never really enjoyed beer but Somewhere along the way, I'm trying to think of what my first like beer experience was that I enjoyed. I want to say it was something dark, like a stout, like maybe uh, it's the Russian monk's name. Oh, uh, you know, talking about the, the um, old Rasputin. Old Rasputin. You know that there. one. Yeah. Yep, yep. That's, That's a very well loved West Coast brew. Right. And I had picked that one up once, and I was like, I'll give it a try. It was thick, dark, delicious. Not like you know a lot of the beers that you find the light, sort of boring. Yep. Again, large jug beers. 
And I thought, wow, okay, beer is kind of interesting. I should start looking more into this. So parlayed into that a little bit, up to the point where my brothers and I all went in and started our own brewery for a short amount of time. We really, yeah, we were started. We were we had a company. I was a silent partner, but I I funded helped fund it. And uh, my youngest brother, Philip, who I mentioned to you, he's uh, yeah. the neuroscientist. He uh, was also does brewing in his spare time. He just kind of does it at home. We rented some space and we bought some equipment and started making our beers. It was called Seven Brothers Brewery. Okay. It was in Orange, uh, sorry, Inland Empire, so Riverside County. Yep. Out there, and we shared space with a couple of other ones, a couple of other like small micro brews, you know, or yeah, I think they're called micro brews or nano breweries. Nano I brews, yeah. To them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we were there for a couple of years, and some people liked our stuff, but it didn't really go anyplace. And then we got a cease and desist from some company in Illinois that had the name Brothers, and they were also making beer. And so uh, oh, yeah. rather than kind of fight the legal battle on that, we decided, eh, maybe, you know, this isn't our chosen path. So sure. we and moved on. Certainly in the craft beer space, and this this may be a little bit secondary to, to spirits and cocktails, but during that time, probably a couple years ago, anywhere from, you know, three to five years ago, it got really, really intense and fairly litigious. Uh, it exploded. Yeah, I was I was actually working before I went full time for Modern Bar Cart. I was working at an IP firm doing marketing, no uh, and it was just fascinating to watch them blog about these beverage disputes and you know how they've been handled and uh, just you know the, the ins and outs of the beverage in- industry. Once the beverage industry realized, oh hey, I need to co- I need to copyright this, right? Uh, or or uh, patent this in, in, in other situations. Um, so, yeah, that's really interesting. Ferments are, are they tend to be the way that, that most people come to hard spirits for the obvious reason that hard spirits are, for the un- uninitiated palate, very intense, very abrasive, very fiery. Sure, um, they burn. So can you trace back any particular instance where you – you know, kind of walked up to a spirit and had that almost like conversion experience? I, uh, I had been kind of playing around with bourbon and I think this was the, uh, right around the time that Mad Men was getting popular. You oh, know, there I'd, you go. I know a lot of people refer to this. Yeah. And I, yeah. I hadn't watched the show at that point, but I, you started to see cocktails kind of come back into the fore and, um, I'd enjoyed a couple of different bourbons, but back then I didn't make a lot of money or have a lot to spend on that sort of thing. So I'd be picking up, you know, Jim Beam, you know, just easy going, not too, too painful. Yeah. But I found, again, much like starting with a light white wine, something light, fruity, and sweet and easy, I would take a little bit of uh, cordial or uh, frangelico, mm-hmm. pour it on top. So there's a drink called the Godfather. Yep. You're probably familiar with it, yeah. Um, similar to that, you take a little bourbon, you pour something sweet on top, and just kind of let it rest, throw it up a little, and enjoy yep. that. It's like, oh, it's like a dessert, you know. So I was doing that. From there, I started to kind of developing a palate for... Uh, whiskeys on their own or on the rocks that took me a long time but i i showed up to a bar in my neighborhood in north hollywood and i asked the bartender i said you know what i'm in the mood for a bourbon but i want something with like more wood flavor and more smoke i want something smoky can you give me something with like smoke i'm just kind of craving that like a campfire you know that's sort of what i'm looking for is there something like that out there because i like beers that taste like that if you could find me a whiskey and she's like i don't know about bourbon but i have this stuff called and she said i have this stuff called the frog La Frog. La Frog. Oh. Uh, maybe you'll like that. And she pulled this bottle down. It was what I learned later was called Lafroy, uh, yeah. 10 year olds. And she pulled the, the she's like, smell the cork. And I smelled it. And I was like, oh, pour me some of that. That smells amazing. Yeah. She poured it for me. And this oh, this stuff turns a lot of people off. It I does. Said, oh, this is my new drink of choice. I can drink this straight. And that's actually rather surprising. So so it's um, it's funny because you, you took us through this progression where it's almost like a parallel structure. I started getting into this and I started with something light and sweet and then I worked my way up. But it seems like all of that training you did with your palate early on almost prepared you to, you know, walk up to that bottle of Lafroig, which is to re- reiterate <laughs> what you said, this is possibly one of the most polarizing bottles that exist. It's it smoky. I love it. It's, it's very my heavy favorite hand. cocktail scotch, Lafroig 10. Oh, yeah. Uh, because it's unmistakable, yep. but it's also like, it's, it's just, it's interesting to me that when it came to spirits, you broke your script there and it's, it's almost like you, you'd kind of been training yourself as you, you know, worked your way through the various ferments to kind of like almost shed some inhibitions, even if it wasn't conscious, right? It's a good way of putting it, but it's, it's certainly a little bit of flipping the script. So that's, that's really <laughs> fascinating. Um, I, I would also like to mention 
just make a, a quick plug for the place where we're, we are recording this. Um, we're at a place called Guild Hall, which is a fascinating bar in its own right. We may get to uh, to talk with uh, one of the bartenders or the owners here a little bit later on. But uh, it's a gaming bar here in uh, in Burbank. Really, a whole other set of topics to, to discuss. <laughs> but you're, and the like. But you're drinking a cocktail that's that's on the menu. You want to take us through that because it actually has a little bit bears a little relation to the Lafroig Ten. That's a good good connection there. This is called the Final Flight. It's a Del Magui Vita Mescal, Chartreuse, yellow Chartreuse, uh, Crime de Noir from Tempest Fugit, also a fantastic company. Yep. And uh, Crime de Cacao, also from uh, Tempest Fugit, with a little lemon expression on top. Yep. And uh, I didn't quite know what to expect with this. The color is pink. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of rosy. Yeah. And I was thinking it was going to be, for some reason I thought it was going to be fruity, but it is exceptionally earthy. And the creme de cacao, you don't even notice it, but it's almost like this uh, rounding out that uh, grounds the Del Magui and the chartreuse. It's a very nice mix. Yeah. I'm enjoying it a great deal. Yeah, and it's funny because we were, we I think we both had kind of a collective eyebrow raise when we looked at that drink on the menu. And I was very skeptical about the, uh, the, the cream and or chocolate uh, notes with the combination of Del Miguel Vita, Mezcal, and the, the lemon. And see, the chocolate and lemon just doesn't seem to go together. But... Uh, this is a really nice cocktail. And the, I'll also mention for anybody else who's out there thinking, listen, I really like smoky flavors or I really want to get more into smoky flavors. If you're a scotch person or a mezcal person, the probably the best middle shelf bottles you can ever pick up to make cocktails with that are interesting and distinctive would be Lafroig 10. Mm. And then Delmage Vida, which mm. is their, uh, it's called an Espadine. Mezcal, and basically what an Espadine Mezcal is, it's it's most, the vast majority of the ones that you're going to find in liquor stores are Espadines, and it means that the agave is somewhat farmed or managed as opposed to uh, wild wild foraged. Uh, some some of these Espadines include wild foraged agave, but, but they're doing some more distinctive management with it, which allows them to, to put out more volume because uh, right now in agave spirits, you know, it's kind of like the Wild West. People can just go out into these community-owned lands and managed lands and just kind of take as much as they want. So there's a bit of a tragedy of the commons going on. But it's for that reason that these managed espadines are the most affordable options in the Mezcal category, which tends to be a very expensive category. So long story short, if you're into the smoky flavors that we've been discussing here, check out Lafroig 10 and check out Del Miguel Vida. Both good choices, especially if you are uh, an enthusiast for cocktails like I am and uh, are looking to experiment with those kinds of flavors. Yeah. So they can be very overpowering, but if you have the right mix, you can make a delicious drink with them. Right. And they can also be, on, on that note, you, you could also sort of use them as a half ounce or a quarter ounce float or a half ounce or a quarter ounce addition to another spirit to kind of bring it to that smoke place. So like if you're making a rum old fashioned and you wanted to throw in a little bit of the Del Miguel Vita, um, that would just, just add just that hint of smoke to a spirit like rum where you rarely encounter that flavor note. So right. it's, it's a cool little trick to have up your sleeve. And you know if you're using a quarter or a half ounce, that bottle's going to go a long way, even if it is expensive. So. Very much so. And you do want to do a light touch with these because they can overpower very quickly. So Right. So we've kind of covered your origin story, as it were. I want to talk a little bit more about your home setup as it got started and kind of took off and, and you built on it. And I also want to talk about um, the process of iteration and record keeping. Uh, I noticed that you've got a, a really nice notebook in front of you here. You obviously, it seems like you like to keep records about things. So I'll let you choose what we talk about next, whether it's the the kind of bar setup that you have or the, the way that you started iterating upon um, cocktail projects and start trying to improve them. Um, so you know, take take us take us to where you want to start and we'll hit everything. I, uh, I wanted to touch base on the origin story a little bit. The scotch bottle I mentioned got me into the LA Scotch Club. And, uh, oh, good. Yeah, I started hanging out with those guys and they have a yearly event an annual called the peaton meeting uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's all peated whiskeys and peated beer and peated barbecue it's quite a party yeah, yeah it's pretty cool like it. and they would have guest cocktail makers come up and so you went to seven grand recently a couple of bartenders for that showed up one time 
Luke and Dustin. I'll give a shout out to them because they're both fantastic. Luke Ford and Dustin Newsom, if you guys can find them. They shout make, out to those fellas. Yeah, they make great cocktails. But they kind of turned me on to the idea that, hey, you don't just have to drink this stuff straight. It's actually quite good uh, mixed in with a number of other things. And that's where I started hanging out at Seven Grand and discovering what cocktails could be from there. So at home, I started buying, because uh, I wanted to try and redo this. I went to a bar in downtown LA called The Edison. This is kind of a, a, a high-end bar that's in the old power-making basement of a building from like the 1930s. Wow. It's very, uh, very Edwardian with like a kind of steampunk feel to it because they've got like you know machinery in the background and whatnot, but you dress up, dress to the nines to go there. I must have been in a James Bond mood because they had a Vesper martini on the, uh, on the menu there. I ordered it, and much like that glass of wine that I had with the Frenchman, I tasted this and I said, oh, this is what a martini is supposed to taste like. Oh, okay, I see now. I'm, I'm getting the balance. I understand it now. And that was a very eye-opening moment for me. So I started trying to make some of those cocktails at home. They were colossal failures. <laughs> they did not turn out the way I wanted to. They had a drink there called the Edison, which was Woodford Reserve, um, pear brandy and pear juice, and I think a twist of something. And I said, I could make that. So I bought all those ingredients. Pear brandy was more expensive than I thought it was going to be. Yep. <laughs> pear juice was also more expensive than I realized. And uh, I just eyeballed it. I was like, I'll pour a little of this in and a little of that in. Figure this out. It'll be fine. Shook it all up. And this stuff was undrinkable. I mean, it was just could oh. not. I didn't want it to go to waste, but I had to. I couldn't drink this and no one else could either. Yeah, there's. it's funny too because I, I'm sort of at the point where... I refuse to pour anything down the drain, even if it's not not up to snuff. But there's definitely early on, there are some dark moments where you're <laughs> you're sitting there, you're like, how how did I get here? How did I get to be standing above this sink with this thing that I'm about to dump out? And like, you both really want to get rid of it, but also it's like it's almost like pouring a little bit of yourself. It's like it's like a, I don't, it's very strange. But every, everybody everybody has those moments. So this was okay. So we've got. The Vesper, can we can we return to this briefly sure. for a quick follow-up question? Yeah. Do you recall if your bartender shook it or stirred? That specific one, I would like to think he shook, as mm -hmm. that's the way that is ordered, generally speaking. With yeah. the, uh, I'm pretty sure that's the way Ian Fleming wrote it in the book. Right. And, yeah, I believe he did shake it. I will add to that that just about every martini I've had since then uh, should be shaken, uh, or I've enjoyed more if it's shaken. Okay. In fact, I now order my martinis bruised because I like the little slivers of ice in there. I enjoy okay. like a little bit of a little more water in it, and it gets a very cold. And I think that when you're having pure alcohol, because that's what that drink is, <laughs> it's yeah. just a whole lot of alcohol. Yeah, uh, to have a little water in there and a little bit of coldness to kind of fight that burn makes it uh, much more uh, palatable. Yeah, this is this may be a bit of a tangent, but I think it actually really relates rather closely to what we're talking about, which is kind of tracing the journey of a home bartender and identifying the, the meaningful points, right? So this this Vesper, this, this particular cocktail at the Edison Bar seemed to be a really interesting tuning fork for you, where you all of a sudden you heard a sound and you were able to kind of like match it in your brain and, and, and suddenly something clicked. So uh, I'm going to add a little bit to this Vesper story. For, for folks who are unaware of what a Vesper is, check out our martini episode. You can just search for that on modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast. It's myself and uh, Modern Bar Cart co-founder Ethan Hall. We talk a little bit more about this, but basically the Vesper is the James Bond martini. It's shaken rather than stirred. As far as the books are concerned, uh, Casino Royale has a really beautiful depiction of this. I think it, I think it's rather nice the way that they present it and the way that they have Daniel Craig. And, you know, after after the <laughs> poker game is over, he, he explains why. He, I think I'll call this the Vesper. Right. 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 So it's, it's, it's very dramatic and really romantic. But it's um, his so, ordering of it, though, is great. The, yes. What he tells the uh, bartender, the waiter. Right. And I think that's pretty true to, to the book. But I, I guess the point is this. One time I was um, at a distillery in D.C. Uh, that will remain nameless. <laughs> and I, I was talking to the bartender there who was also, you know, kind of like making the gin. And this person, you know, I, I was I was talking about how I enjoyed Vespers. And it was in the summer in D.C. It's it's not like the West Coast, like out here where it's nice dry heat. It's t It's a terrible, oppressive swamp heat. And so uh, I was really getting into make myself a Vesper when I got home from work. And, and for the same reasons that you just described, I, I would shake it up in a cobbler shaker as opposed to a Boston shaker. Right. And 
that's really nice because it allows just the tiniest, that little strainer that's built into the top allows just the tiniest ice shards to come through. So you get like actually rather uniform little ice chips in there, which mm -hmm. I find nice. Yeah, me too. But I loved that dilution. And because the Vesper is a cocktail that does not contain citrus juice, conventional logic would dictate that you stir it. Right. And so that's what this distiller ended up kind of telling me in, in like a not in a in a not nice way of like like oh you you shake your vespers like and it, <laughs> I was just like wait a minute like how 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 does this work and and so it, it, that was a moment where I realized that um, like my personal preferences really you know shouldn't be subject to these like very like strict rules of cocktail just because conventional wisdom tells you something it doesn't mean that your tastes are going to match up with that right and i like that, that your taste and my taste seem to be very similar in that respect because like yeah shaking a cocktail is going to give it those ice shards and, and in this all booze cocktail i really love it and yeah. and the thing that i love even more is especially when that vesper is the first cocktail that you have after a long day, it's you shake it up, it's cloudy, you get the excitement of feeling that ice cold shaker in your hands. Mm -hmm. so you're like, oh, 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 you're kind of like <laughs> it's coming, like, licking your chops a little bit. <laughs> and then when you pour it into the glass, uh, a nice stemmed coupe glass here is 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 a great choice. Yep. And I really recommend not skimping on the lemons. Make sure you do a good lemon twist on there. It comes out nice and cloudy, and then over the course of like two to four minutes, it, it becomes crystal clear. Mm -hmm. And so you take your first couple sips when it's cloudy, and then as the cocktail kind of sinks in, you kind of like get that little clarity and that like kind of like the the that deep exhalation of like ah oh, the day is over I'm resetting and I kind of like how the the cocktail almost like matches my experience of it like that. So I, I really enjoyed that story uh, about how you know it kind of clicked with you. So the failures aside. <laughs> right. So the, the pear juice going down the drain aside, what were some of your early first successful, I guess, equipment acquisitions mm -hmm. or experiments that, that kind of like set you more on your way? Well, early on, um, I was using measuring spoons and measuring cups, you know, because that's what we had. Um, so like measuring spoons, like the the little ones that come on the key ring. Kind yeah, of. they use for baking. Exactly. Yep. They've got some Mickey Mouse ones at home. <laughs> uh, just whatever you could find. Um, and that, if you get a good measuring cup, it'll tell you ounces, uh, yep. which is nice. Uh, but as you start to research cocktail recipes more, you realize that only a, usually they only go up, up to a certain number of ounces, and there are jiggers which uh, will do all that for you. So I have a two-sided jigger at home. It's one ounce on one side and two ounces on the other. Usually you can eyeball if you want to do a half or a quarter ounce or anything like that from right. what that you know fill line is. If you can find a really good jigger, we'll actually have fill lines on it that tells you where the half, quarter, three quarters, and so on is. Right. The jigger was exceptionally helpful for measuring to the point where if you use it enough, um, I just don't even have, for the most part, I can eyeball it. I know what two ounces looks like now. I know what one ounce or a quarter ounce looks like now. I have just a general idea to where I, I only use it when I'm trying new recipes. Yeah. But if it's recipes I'm comfortable with, then uh, yeah, I don't even need to have that equipment there. On top of that, I also got, you mentioned it earlier, a Boston shaker. Yeah. Now, I had a cobbler shaker for a while, but <laughs> you got to be careful with those cobbler shakers because the vacuum that... <laughs> I know exactly <laughs> where form, this is going. <laughs> and also, if it's not a well-made cobbler shaker, the metal warps. And so I, my, some friends of mine who I used to make drinks for a lot and use their cobbler shaker a lot... Uh, found that that cobbler shaker doesn't open anymore <laughs> it's perma closed oh no and they can't i mean there's a drink inside there that will never be drunk <laughs> it's, oh it's, yeah it's like schrodinger's cocktail <laughs> except you except you sort of know that it's dead <laughs> yeah it's true <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so i moved on to the boston shaker which i prefer a great deal yeah uh, tip for the boston shaker hit the glass from the side when you want to get it out Mm -hmm. it's a quick like strike of your palm of your hand and yep. it loosens it up nicely yeah exactly and another little danger warning with cobbler shakers especially if you have like if you get it like a mine is a pretty good one mine's lasted mine hasn't warped or anything nice what, what i've found is that and my wife does this so carolyn stop it makes me nervous <laughs> especially when i've got coupe glasses sitting on the counter which is not a good idea. You shouldn't leave your coupe glasses just sitting on the counter. But what happens is uh, after you pour out the drink, if you leave the ice in the, the cobbler shaker and put that little cap back on it, mm -hmm. it's going to warm up. 
the air is going to expand and that cap is going to go shooting off at some <laughs> indeterminate point in time and it's going to come back down potentially on your nice delicate coupe glasses and, and then you've got a broken glass. This oh. has, it hasn't happened yet, but it's come close to happening enough times where I figured I'd mention that little cobbler shaker fact. You don't have that issue with the Boston shakers. <laughs> yeah, good rule of thumb if you have a cobbler shaker, empty it out quickly. Yeah. Also, don't put anything that's carbonated into it. <laughs> sure. Yeah. That And that makes the seal. I mean, regardless of a cobbler shaker or a Boston shaker, if you put some carbonated stuff in there, it's going to make the seal go sideways real fast and you're going to have just a mess all over your shirt. So, yep. <laughs> okay. So we got some, uh, some equipment acquisitions. Uh, I'm, I'm curious about and feel free as we have been so far, as long as it's a compliment feel free to mention brand names that have been particularly helpful for you because I know that, that our listeners are really interested in you know finding finding those bottles that are going to make a difference, just like the Lafroy 10 made a big difference right. for you. So what about the software? I call, I call this like the bar software. software. <laughs> um, well, I'll say find a bar. I'll say that first. Find a bar that will pour you small pours of stuff. Like uh, seven grand, they will give you a third of an ounce or a full you know, full of three ounces. I'm sorry, they'll, they'll pour one ounce or three ounces, depending on what you're looking for. Sure. I spent a lot of time at that place because I could order one third of a drink to try and decide whether or not I wanted to get more of it, and they charge me one third of the price. Yep. Great way to do your research. You educate yourself that way. If you're looking for some non expensive bottles that are good, um, I honestly love the Jim Beam White Label. I think it's a great bourbon to start out with. Totally. There's and it's everywhere. It. And it is everywhere. Very it's easy everywhere. to find. Another good one if you want to try rye, if you're looking to make a you know a good old fashioned uh, Rittenhouse. Yep, Rittenhouse is like a twenty to thirty dollar bottle of rye that is terrific. It yep. is fantastic, and there's nothing wrong with it at all. Is is that bonded? You know, I believe it is. I think it is. It's hundred proof, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it is. Which yeah. is yeah, Rittenhouse terrific recommendation. It's a bottle that never stays long at my bar. <laughs> if I could get handles of it, I would do it more <laughs> often. But, but the problem is, whenever I get it, it's like it's all of a sudden comes to like the front of my consciousness that there's a bottle of Rittenhouse around and it's like, oh, well, there's no other choice that I'm making it with this. And it, it just go in there bottle, you know, the last two weeks and then it's gone. So, right. But yeah. Rittenhouse is a great, great option. And, um, you know, along the, the Jim Beam line, it's, it's not the best bourbon out there. It's just not, it's, no. it's, it's not even like particularly good, but if you start with that, it's actually more in keeping with the way that cocktails were meant to be made. It might not be my recommendation for a sipping bourbon, but for a cocktail bourbon, these cocktails were invented back at a time when spirits were super rough, way rougher than that Jim Beam is today. And so it's almost a more like traditional approach to start building yourself up. And then and then you sort of start to understand like, okay, this is what a sort of like base level, this is a cocktail. This is an old fashioned. What else could an old fashioned be? And that's when you start kind of upping your bottle price. Like once you get a little bit more comfortable with your ability to make something and not dump it down the drain. Right. Cool. Any other bottles? I'm a big fan of Tanqueray, uh, but uh -huh. I always recommend that with a warning that, especially now, gin has really become a lot broader. Yeah. And there's a bunch of different flavor profiles you can get depending on the bottle you have. Tanker is, I think, a, a good introductory point to let you know what gin, classic gin tastes like. Yeah. But uh, I would always recommend, you know, tr if that doesn't work for you, try different brands, see what else is out there. I'm a big fan of, if you're looking to mix, Carpano Antica is just phenomenal and worth whatever you want to pay for it. Right. Um, it's a vermouth that is sweet, delicious, uh, well-bodied, and pairs with just about any spirit I've thrown at it. Yep. It's hard to go wrong with that. It really is. And the nice thing about Carpano Antica is, uh, for example, some people, and this is a slightly mixed metaphor because Carpano Antica is a sweet vermouth and this martinis or a, a dry vermouth cocktail, but a lot of people out there have an aversion to any cocktails that include vermouth because they had their first experience with skunked vermouth. Yeah. And so if you're trying, if you're, if you're one of those people, you know, you're just like, ugh, I hate vermouth. And that's the hurdle that's keeping you from experimenting. I would say if you go out and pick up a bottle of Carpano Antica, and the nice thing about Carpano Antica is they sell in one liter bottles and 500 milliliter bottles, yeah, which is it. different than your traditional 750. And the cool thing about this is that the 500 ml bottle is less of a commitment 
and it is a, it's a little bit more on the expensive side. So they did you a, a solid by offering a smaller volume for a, a less price. And then if you know you're going to use it, then you've got that one liter. So it, it really is savings on both ends. And the nice thing about Carpano Antica is that it's so good that even if you know that about yourself, I feel confident recommending that like it's an amazing sweet vermouth and it will completely rewrite that code in your brain that, that has caused you to not like vermouth. So that's another great bottle. It opened a lot of doors for me. It wasn't an early one I came to. I only discovered it recently, but it's well worth uh, getting into. I want to talk a little bit more about iteration and record keeping here. Uh, and I figured maybe <laughs> the way that we could get into that is by talking about like, aside from bottles and aside from tools that you picked up, are there any slight improvements in technique over time or, or the way that you approach constructing or, or um, reapproaching your cocktails that, that seem to have made a difference? So most cocktails are just in basic math. It's, it's figuring out levels and, and what you want that cocktail to do. If you pick up Jerry Thomas's book, which is a cocktail guide from the 1880s, I want to say, mm -hmm. you'll find that just about every drink in there is bitters, sugar, alcohol and ice and that's all mm -hmm. and once you realize that okay i'm just working with three ingredients here three or four ingredients here you can do a lot of different things it doesn't have to be all that complex it doesn't have to be a deconstructed steampunk rendition of a cocktail it can be fairly straightforward and approachable working from that knowledge starting there you get those three ingredients and you just put a little bit of one in and a little bit of the other in and just start to balance things out once you discover what your palate likes it becomes a lot easier that's generally how I came to it. Yeah. And I would suggest that for any enthusiast who's looking to learn more. Totally. And it, the way that you were describing that, it, it seems to me that really what we're talking about is risk and reward. There's anytime you, you go to put together a cocktail, there's a risk that you might mess it up. And the reward would be creating a good cocktail that's not only satisfactory, but that kind of like intellectually stimulates you with like oh damn like this is pretty cool like the, like the cocktail that we're enjoying now at Guildhall mm. and I think the big difference between the risk and the reward is the difference between taste and flavor and the levels that you're talking about those ratios tend to revolve at least at the basic level around tastes around acid sugar bitterness mm -hmm. these are things that that exist on the tongue the real full sense of flavor has more to do with aromatics and, and, and stuff that's a little bit more fine-tuned. So if you're talking about like those levels, like figuring out like the levels that you enjoy, mastering those levels, I think a good way to think about it would be like, okay, the risk is that this cocktail is going to taste shitty. Right. How to avoid making a shitty cocktail is by understanding the relations of those very basic tastes. Sweet, sour, bitter, and then salty and umami are a little bit like side thing it's less less common in cocktails but if you just focus on sweet sour bitter and then dilution being the thing that kind of mitigates the conversation between those three tastes if you can do sweet sour bitter and get your dilution right you've completely eliminated the risk in your cocktail and then you can focus on the reward you can focus on oh i really like the aromatics in carpano antica more than the aromatics in punta mez when i'm mixing with this written house right that's a higher order that's way up the pyramid the hierarchy of needs than these very basic sweet sour bitter things so if you're looking to minimize the 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 risk and increase the reward start with those tastes and then work your way up to the flavors but it is all about iteration yeah and practice makes perfect yeah uh, you talked about technique like uh Having a good paring knife helps to peel an orange or a lemon or a lime. Sure. But if you got a, and if, uh, if you have a vegetable peeler or something like that, practice, 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 because you want to get that peel without the white pith. Yeah. Yeah, I can do that very well now. When I started off, <laughs> I couldn't do it at all. I was terrible at it, yeah. and it would taste, you know, the taste would reflect that. Sure. But if you get comfortable with it, it gets a lot better. So it shouldn't yeah. be something to be frightened of. No, certainly not. Um, so let's talk about record keeping practices. Uh, because we, we uh, here at Modern Bar Cart obviously kind of doubled down on record keeping practices recently. We published the Essential Tasting Journal for Spirits and Cocktails. And, um, you know, this is we we think this is a really good way to uh, to get into a formal and consistent method of, of keeping track of the cocktails and, and how, how they went 
uh, or your spirit impressions when you taste a new bottle. Um, you seem to have a, a pretty interesting record keeping practice. So can you talk to, about how it started and, and how it has evolved? So I uh, brought this notebook that I made myself, actually. I took apart an old book that someone was throwing away, and I put some rings through it, yeah. punched a couple of holes into it, and uh, and this is, uh, <laughs> it's kind of interesting because I decorated it. I don't know if you see that inside there. It's the, uh, I took this from a very old thing called the Creative Handbook. Okay. I think it still exists here in L.A., but this was a book back in the day that if you worked in the industry, the film industry, you wanted this book because it had all the professionals who did things for the film industry. And if you're like, oh, I need editing done, or I need to rinse a lighting kit, who can I look up to find that you just like a phone book for entertainment industry wow and this thing was huge i mean it was like a four inch thick book interesting it was gigantic with the advent of the internet and all totally. the records becoming informational electronic now i don't use this nearly as much anymore like i have old recipes in here right but i kind of just i brought it as a visual representation of how the things have changed right now i mean i started a blog and i just started writing down the blog I started was for tasting notes. Mm -hmm. And part of the problem was that I would go to these drinking events and I'd have 12 shots of something. I mean, not full shots, taster shots, so quarter yeah. ounce pours right, or half right, ounce right. pours. And by, you know, shot 10, I couldn't remember what it was I was drinking or how it tasted. So I'd always want to write it down, keep notes, because it gets a little blurry towards the end of the night and you want to know if that last one you had is something you really want to spend the money on. Especially if you're dealing with scotch where they deliberately try and mess with our pronunciation and, uh, and <laughs> syntax. It's, that, I was at the seven grand last night when they were doing a scotch uh, vertical and it was just not even Pedro, the guy who runs the event, was able to pronounce some of this stuff. It was, <laughs> who it was, was there last night? Do you remember? Uh, it was a really wonderful company that uh, they, they own a couple different distilleries okay. um, I believe the the company name is distel like or uh, oh. like or distill right um, d e s t i l l or or the inverse of that um, but they had um, they had a, a, a southern Highland a couple southern Highland expressions and then a couple islas and uh, an interesting island as well so we get a, co a couple of different um, uh, looks at different regions from that single portfolio, uh, but the names were just over the top. Right. So, um, but yeah, let's get back so to, yeah, to your the, book here. I would, I would handwrite a lot of these things, but my handwriting would go blurry as the night goes on. Uh, what I found is with the advent of technology and cameras in everyone's phones is I could just take a bottle of the label, I could take a few quick text notes, yep. and then I could, you know, publish this to a blog or have it just on my phone. I used Box for a little while. Box is an information keeping tool that you can have downloaded. But really, I just have a WordPress blog that I you know, take a few photos, upload them up there, and be like, oh, yeah, I like that one. Or there's a couple of words about that. Yeah. I have an app that's it's beer, but there's an app called Untapped where you can check beer in and then have a couple of notes about it. And it's honestly, every time I look at a menu, there's 17 different beers on it. I have to ask myself, have I had some of these before? Sure. Because I've tried hundreds and hundreds at this point. It's kind of hard to keep up. Yeah. So, yeah, just having your phone with you can be really helpful. And uh, there's plenty of tools out there, internet and otherwise, to... Uh, record all of that mm -hmm. i find it was helpful for me yeah untapped is a great tool for beer for sure to be honest you know we've uh, it has gone around the modern bar cart uh board table of like uh oh, do we need to make this for cocktails and there's huh. there's some problems with it i'll leave it at that yeah. but uh but untapped is un undoubtedly a great tool for beer and um i did have a question though so like sure. when you when you were walking around um these events with this notebook did it in any way um like get weird looks or were you the only one doing something like this definitely not no there were a lot of people who were taking notes i mean you have people who do this professionally or people who want to be doing it professionally i mean there are my my blog online you know that's for me that's yeah. just note keeping there are people who publish and have fans and followers and uh folks who are paying them money in order to talk about their stuff i had some people contact me to try it like i had some guy in florida contact me once uh, because he saw that I was writing about cocktails and spirits. And he's like, I have a whiskey thing I do out here. Maybe you can sell it. And I'm like, I'm not really, I don't have followers on my blog. You know, yeah. I'm not, thanks, but sure. that's not really for me. But there are people who are doing this professionally. And yeah, these are like journalists. This is their job. Yeah. You know? And so it's, I think it's common. I think you'd see it a lot. I'm really glad that was your response because, uh, you know, obviously we're, we're selling tasting journals now. We hope people are going to use them to improve. And, and I, I, I do think that if you go to one of these events, and you bring along a, a, a notebook or a journal, uh, you're not going to be the only one there. It, it's so so. Feel empowered, listeners, to to do start taking notes, 
in public. At, you, you can do it at your bar. You're not going to get a weird look. The bartender's probably just going to treat you better. I'll actually tell you a story. I went yeah. to a place in West Hollywood for dinner one time, and I brought, because I wanted to blog about it, a notebook with me, and I was taking notes. And the chef came out and met me and, like, had a conversation with me about the way they cook things. I think they thought I was, like, working for a newspaper or something. <laughs> they weren't really sure who I was, but they were super nice to me. They gave me a free drink, like, on the house. Yeah, it was it was a great experience. And it's just because I had a notebook with me and I was taking notes. Yeah, so that is a low-key, really amazing case for taking your notebook with you. Awesome. Yes. I'm, <laughs> I'm starting it. to dig this. Okay. <laughs> so the blog, mainly for you, uh, can you describe for our listeners what a good set of tasting notes or what a valuable set of tasting notes means to you um, because for everybody it's a little bit different everyone's focusing on something slightly different so what, what do you try and make a point to record every single time expressions or rather i should say impressions the impressions i have of a drink i think is the most important thing do you have people who follow and i, I used to be this way my early notes are very detailed um you know you go for look smell Mouthfeel, taste, uh, f follow up or end, finish. Yeah, finish. Thank you. And uh, overall impressions. Yeah. And you can do all that, and that's all well and good. But sometimes when you're in a hurry, especially if you're trying a lot of different beers, <laughs> yeah, cocktails you should be drinking a lot slower, so you have time to write that out. Right. Honestly, I think that's part of the experience. You take a sip of something. You look at something. A glass is placed before you, and you sit and you look at it for a moment and just consider it. Yeah, write that down. Consider we'll... the cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be the the new podcast we come up with. Yes, <laughs> consider the cocktail, <laughs> and uh, you, it, it, you're in a place. You have an aroma. You you feel a certain way. It's about that experience, and that is what the impression is. And if you're a particularly loquacious person, then you could uh, write a lot, mm -hmm. but you don't necessarily have to. If you're in a hurry, you can you know just write down this was good. It tasted like, you know damp leaves in a campfire sure <laughs> and uh, it made me happy yeah i mean you know that'll give you enough to go back when you look at it again and be like oh i had a good time with this i think i'll order it again okay yeah but yeah. if you're looking to be more poetic yeah feel free take your time talk to your bartender or just sit and take some notes and enjoy right yeah i like the um the point that you just made about like walking up to like walking up to a thing and looking at it, like considering it and um to me this this kind of gets back to uh our approach here at Modern Bar Cart when it comes to tasting these things, which is it's governed by a concept called affordance theory. And literally affordance theory is, say you walked up to a ball. If there was a ball sitting on a table, you picked up the ball, the ball is spherical, the ball is blue. And so if, what affordance theory means is you start asking questions. You say, what does this ball afford? Well, mm -hmm. it's spherical, so it affords rolling. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, it's rubber, so it affords bouncing. Mm -hmm. And you start to just understand the qualities of this thing that's in front of you simply by just asking questions about it. And it doesn't have to be more difficult than that. You know, we, we hear, uh, you know, all these crazy tasting notes coming out like, oh, it's uh, forest floor and barnyard and petrol and, <laughs> and all these crazy Bilge esoteric and notes. rope. Yes. Yeah. yeah, rope. That's a great tasting. <laughs> now, is that polypropylene or is that more of like a nylon braid? Oh, um, man. So, uh, <laughs> You've hung around with some beer drinkers, I see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, but it doesn't have to be. It can just be – That that's why it – I guess if I had to make one point out of out of our conversation so far, it would be that any barriers to entry in spirits and cocktails are entirely within the person who is 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 tasting them, and and I'd say the only barrier to entry is just unfamiliarity. Mm. Um, you know, once you become familiar with something, once you walk up to it and pick it up and turn it around in your hands often enough, you just get this implicit understanding about it and I think that's where some of the magic and some of the like uh, almost like the smoke and mirrors of cocktails comes in because if you're not familiar with things if you just walk into a cocktail bar and you're not used to cocktails it looks like magic it looks like alchemy it's not yeah it really isn't but uh, once you start familiarizing yourself and really just asking honest questions about what's in front of you I think you, you can make a lot of progress which which we're seeing here um, so so with your blog first of all if you're comfortable sharing it if you want you know people to to be able to learn from what you've done please feel free to share it if not no worries um, <laughs> but uh, you know like tell us is there any way that your tasting notes have evolved from like when you first started taking them to now I think, uh, as you said, there's a familiarity that comes along with it. You also, when you hang around with people who do this, either professionals or enthusiasts, they will 
develop your vocabulary. You will learn to describe things in certain ways, much like, you know, oh, this tastes smoky versus, oh, this tastes like uh, polyphenic or uh, phenolic, mm -hmm. you know, something like that. It, again, it could be, you can get as detailed as you need to be. But developing that vocabulary, I think, helps, and it helps with expression. And that's kind of what I, I think that's what my driving theme is. You and I talked a little bit about this before, is that I want to express my creativity somehow. Mm -hmm. And I used to do that by cooking. I cooked a lot, and I enjoyed experimenting with new flavors and bold flavors. And uh, making cocktails is very much the same thing, only yeah. you don't have to light the stove to do it. Right. You, know, you don't right. have to make a huge mess. You just have a couple of different uh, glasses out, and uh, that's all you really need. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, I like that you know, you're talking about expression and, and I, I think with tasting notes, the best advice that I can give, and this is, this is a, a free little synopsis of one part of the, the essential tasting journal for spirits and cocktails, a really easy way to take your tasting notes from like a very basic level to a, a bit more of an intermediate level might be to start thinking of a, a tasting note as a story. Yeah. Um, and sometimes like, you know, you'll write tasting notes. You don't re even realize that you told a story, but you did because, you know, uh, stories have a beginning and middle of an end. They have characters in them, which are kind of like the different flavors. And these characters interact with each other. Sometimes they phase in and out. Sometimes they start in one place and end up in a completely new place. And so if you think of your tasting notes as a story with a beginning and middle and end, which is sort of like the aroma, the palette, and the finish, right? It's right. got some parallel structure there. Right. Um, you know, that's a really easy way to almost like trick yourself into writing more thorough tasting notes if you say, okay, did I get the beginning? Yep. Okay, I got the aroma. And now the, the middle, the climax is definitely the palette, right? That's where the most stuff is going on. And then the end is the is the finish and you know yeah it's like if you if you look at those traditional visual representations of story structure it looks exactly the same way yeah. what does it leave you with yeah 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 so yeah that's if there's one like little bit of advice for taking it from like a basic level to a, a more advanced level i think you just ask yourself am i telling a story with this tasting note and is the story that i'm telling something that's going to be useful to future me <laughs> uh, because if it's not useful to future you then you know okay there's not much of a point unless you're blogging about it so right Right. Yeah. And that is where, like I said, my notes have become a bit more utilitarian because they will be useful to me in the future. Yeah. Do I want to order this again? What story did this tell? Is that an experience I want to go through again? Totally. Totally. Yeah. Well, Sam, this has been great. Um, I want to do some lightning round questions here. Is there sure. anything, any other points that you wanted to uh, to, to make about your, your journey as a home bartender and your kind of like evolution from, uh, from ferments to spirits to cocktails to tasting notes? Um, all I'll say is that... Uh, Learn when shaking and stirring is appropriate. <laughs> yeah. There are some that do better than others in that. Um, that being said, don't be afraid to buck the trend occasionally. Yeah. Because they, again, they will tell you one way and you may like it the other. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, we can do lightning round. Let's do it. Cool. Uh, so first question. Uh, what is your favorite cocktail? And if you don't have a favorite of all time, what's something you've been getting into recently? I think it depends on the weather. It's been cold and rainy here in L.A. recently. And uh, I've been really jonesing on the Negroni. It's... Uh, just a delicious mix. It's complex, but not too crazy. It's sweet and strong, and it'll keep you warm on that rainy day. Yeah. If it's warm outside, I'm a big fan of the daiquiri. Simple, very approachable. Totally. Yeah. Totally. And you've got a stirred and a shaken cocktail right there. Mm -hmm. um, with Neg the Negroni in particular, um, any particular uh, gin that you enjoy using? Um, For a Negroni? Oh, man. I'm going to blank on the name here. There was one I found that used saffron to as one of the uh, botanicals. Mm. I'm trying to remember the name of it now, and I apologize. I'm I'm blanking on it. It wasn't it wasn't um, yellow, was it? It wasn't particularly. You know what? It had a little bit of a tinge to it, but it was okay. more rose colored, as I recall. Interesting. Yeah. There's a, a uh, there's actually a saffron gin that is made in the Burgundy region of France. Oh no, kidding! And it's like bright, bright yellow. So that's huh. a it's a weird ingredient that I don't think I've come across in the U.S. But yeah, so saffron. Yeah, that's an interesting flavor to pair with uh, with a sweet vermouth and a, a Campari because it saffron. It's got a bit of that like wet earthy character to it. Right, and uh, I think that's that's a that's a nice like intriguing pairing that you're not going to find in many gins. That's uh, that's kind of useful in, an, in a kind of interesting take on the Negroni. If you can find it, yes, there is a really nice gin from Nika right now. It's a Japanese. Uh, they do a lot of whiskey. I want to say, is Jim Beam on them now? Uh, you know? They own Jim, Jim Beam. Beam. 
Oh, they. Oh, that's right. They bought Jim Beam. That's right. Oh, it might not be Nika. Was it Nika or was it Suntory? Suntory. Suntory. It's Beam Suntory. Beam. Yeah, Suntory right? Sorry. Yeah. Apologies. So, yeah. But Nika's still the independent, quote yeah, unquote, in Japan. They're still badasses. But yeah, man, they make some fantastic malt, and their gin is just as fantastic and yeah. a little bit different than your standard London Dry. I, I haven't had it yet, to be honest. It's on the list. I wish um, I brought some. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it'll it'll mix quite well, but it also does well on its own. It's got some excellent character. Good, good. Yeah. That's a great recommendation. So next question. If you were a cocktail ingredient, what would you be and why? Well, I, I hate to repeat myself, but I'm a huge fan of the Carpano Antica. And uh, I choose that because I am complex but sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Enough said. Yeah, well, and, and it's... Uh, it's great to affiliate yourself with like the undisputed heavyweight champion of sweet breaks. <laughs> um, that's a that's that's fantastic. Uh, and and you know what? If you're an option, I'm gonna go for I'm gonna go for Carpano Antico pretty much any time, unless unless I'm making something weird like a Fernet Flip or something like that, where I'm gonna use a Punta Mez. But I, it's hard to pass up the Carpano when it's sitting there. So there is a really nice one out that's a Cardamaro. Similar. Have you familiar mm-hmm. with that one? Yes. There's cardamom. Yeah. Yep. That one is, it's, you can find it in a lot of places, but I've just recently found that one and I thought, oh, this is, the other one is Tempest Fugit has a Kina door. Mm-hmm. Have you had that one? Yeah. I, think I, that one's I, I don't think I've had that one, but I've seen it. It's, I may have had it in a cocktail. Anything Tempest Fugit, man, those guys are phenomenal. They do really good work. Good. Yeah. yeah. And, and since we're in California, I feel like I mention this fairly often, um, like a weird independent champion for this company. But uh, there's a sweet vermouth based out of California called uh, Via. Oh, you V-Y-A. I, I went and looked those guys up. They're close to where I grew up. Yeah. My, my parents live in the Central Valley still, so I drive by mm-hmm. where they're their location is i'm gonna go and check it out yeah please do I, I don't think that the the vermouth brand is necessarily the same as the company that makes it. i think the the vermouth vya via is probably like their little it's like a product line that may be produced by a, a larger company hmm. uh, but i came to them with their driver their dry vermouth is remarkable love it love it love it and their sweet vermouth is good for me for some cocktails it's got a a, a pretty noteworthy cinnamon note which hmm. Sometimes it's useful for me. Sometimes it's not Depending as Depending on the drink. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So that's one where I like to have it on hand. I love cooking with it. Oh. It's incredible cooking vermouth. If you do any slow cooker stuff, and I know this is a cocktail podcast, but bear with me. <laughs> a, if you don't have a slow cooker, get a slow cooker. It changes your life. B, the, the, the Via sweet vermouth is something that I'll add to pretty much any time I'm cooking like a roast in the slow cooker add like maybe a quarter cup of that to the bottom of it and the gravy that I get as a result is just so I will, I will throw a note of caution there is that be aware of the ABV of what you're putting into a slow cooker because you can heat that stuff up, but the alcohol it doesn't cook off nearly as fast if you have it in a slow cooker because yeah. the lid. Yep. And I made a stew with brandy one time, Ooh. and the potatoes are alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, just <laughs> cooking with alcohol I'm a huge fan of. Yeah. But uh, just understand that the, you have to have it open in order for the alcohol to escape. Otherwise, people are going to get drunk right. on, on what you're making. And that's good advice, too, because like, that's the same way the stills work, right? They, they condense, and then if you the condenser arm shunts the, the liquid off to a separate part of the distillation chain, and if it doesn't, it just falls back into the regular... Yeah, yeah. That, I hadn't thought about that. You can get away with it with sweet vermouth. Vermouth but, should be fine. Yeah, man. but for anything else, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> okay, so here's the here's the uh, the widowmaker question. Uh, cocktail with anybody, past or present, who would it be? Where would you go? What would you drink? Paint us a picture. Oh, I have to paint you a picture? That's going to be hard now. Uh, so I had written down Wilford Brimley. Wilford Brimley. Yeah, man, that guy's got a great mustache. He does. He does. Uh, is this Wilford Brimley uh, in his uh, in his heyday, or is this like Wilford Brimley, Walker, Texas Ranger? Yeah, <laughs> pre-Walker, Texas Ranger. Okay. Thinking The Thing from the 1980s, the John Carpenter remake. Uh, thereabouts, because he was, he was big enough, but he had some life experience at that point. Yes. I read that he used to be a bodyguard for Howard Hughes. <laughs> okay. Which, yeah, random. Yeah. But that guy's got some stories, man. I know he does, and he's been in Hollywood forever. That's true. Yeah. And, and so Wilford Brimley, what the hell is he drinking? And, and are you drinking the same thing, or are you getting a cocktail? <laughs> Wilford <laughs> Wilford Brimley is drinking, like, straight bourbon <laughs> with no chaser. And I'm probably going to get a cocktail that complements whatever it is he's having and trying yeah. to convince him why he changed his mind. Well, I mean, he... You know what? As long as he gets his... 
diabetes testing supplies from Liberty Medical. I think we're in the clear. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're plugging a lot of different brands here today, aren't yeah. we? <laughs> I don't even know if they still exist, but that was probably the funniest commercial of my childhood. I remember it well. Diabetes. <clears throat> yeah, he still shows up occasionally. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So Wilford Brimley, straight bourbon. I love it. Um, <laughs> all right. So now we're on to some advice. We've been giving a, a decent amount of advice here. Um, but we don't really have too, too much on the, the books side of things. So I'm wondering, as you were doing all this stuff that we've uh, discussed in this interview so far, were there any books that were particularly meaningful to you? There is one that I really greatly enjoy, and it's called uh, The Gentleman's Companion by Charles H. Baker. Okay. And it was written in the, I want to say, late 20s, kind of in the height of the Depression. No, I'm sorry. It would have been the 20s, and I think alcohol was still prohibited yep. in the United States. So yep. uh, this fellow was a, uh, a yachtsman, kind of in the upper crust. He liked to sail, and he sailed to all parts of the world, a lot in the Caribbean, to go and get drunk. <laughs> he would go to Ports of Call to just drink. Yeah. And he wrote about it, and the guy just tells these phenomenal stories. I mean, they're the, the people he drinks with, the way he paints a picture, he can do it so much better than I can. And you just feel like you're there with him. And, you know, he'll be like, oh, yes, this uh, this drink we had with uh, the admiral who was in charge of this small vessel that was parked in Shanghai yeah. <laughs> in late April one night. And, uh, and you know, they he's just crazy, crazy stories. And the, this guy got up to a lot of trouble. But he wrote about it, and he drank a whole lot, and he ate a lot. He's got two books out. He's got The Gentleman's Companion, and then I think it's The South American Gentleman's Companion. They both are out of print, but you can still find them at, at your local library. Or um, my wife was kind enough. Give a plug to my wife. Thank you, Angel, uh, for <laughs> giving me this book for Christmas. Uh, she found a company online that takes old books and republishes them oh, if good. enough people order them. And so I guess enough people wanted that one. And so she found me a way to condense those two books into one volume. So I have it on my shelf at home. Very, very nice. That's yeah. a cool recommendation. And for obvious reasons, it's scarcity. We haven't had that one. So um, we'll try and do some digging online. We'll get some web page relevant to the to the text uh, linked up in the show notes page over at modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast. So head on over there and we'll we'll share links to some of the other things that we've been talking about as well. I would also like to plug, uh, not a book, but the website Esquire. David Wondrich has been mentioned on this podcast a few times. He has his own podcast, I think. He like does. Behind Bars. I yeah, it's his. a little bit more recent. I think it launched maybe about a year ago. Yeah, uh, I'm not quite great. sure how regularly they publish it, but um, yeah, I mean, he's just... David Wondrich is uh, yeah, he's a he's, magical beast. <laughs> he is, but he writes really well. Go to Esquire.com. His stuff is great there. In fact, that's where I first got the uh, idea of the mathematics behind cocktails. Yep. Is they had an uh, article called the... The new Esquire cocktail, I think it was called. And that's all it was. Is it broken down. That's where I learned about Aperol. I didn't know what Aperol was before okay. that. Yeah. But yeah, lots of good advice there. Very easy to follow. Good. Yeah. Uh, I find that places where David Wondrich has popped in and out of tend to have good uh, good stuff on cocktails. So, you know, whether it's Imbibe Magazine or Esquire, you know, I tend to not only when I'm searching for a recipe, I, I don't just type the recipe into the Google search bar. I'll type in that recipe and Esquire, that recipe and Imbibe Magazine or and Punt Punch is also a good source of yeah. fairly reliable classic takes. Um, that So I, I try to modify my searches based on places I know had strong influence by people who know what they're talking about. So um, great advice there. When it comes to just overall... Maybe advice might be too, too strong a term here, but, but do you have any, I guess parting thoughts that you think might be valuable to people who are kind of approaching things from the the home and creative place like the the same place that you're approaching cocktails from do you have any any thoughts uh, that might be useful for them as we round this out just not to get discouraged stay vigilant be bold you can be bold with your flavors and understand that you will have mistakes that you will have accidents and stumbles minimize them and uh, move on and grow from them is, uh, you shouldn't have to be turned off to an entire uh, line of cocktails or just a theme of enjoyment just because you made one or two mistakes. Right, right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as we've as we've covered here in the conversation, just because somebody else out there who might be an authority figure th thinks something is, is right or wrong doesn't mean you got to listen to them. Right. Um, you know, even, even if they end up being right, there's something to be said for figuring out yourself and... and I think in in that process of learning and iteration, you get an intuitive sense of why it might be right or wrong. Uh, like we like we both love ice chips in our vespers. Right, it's like that's right for us. Yeah, it works for you. Yeah. If it works for you, go with it. Totally. 
Sam, can you just share with folks, if, if anybody listens to this and says like, man, I, I really want to check out the, the way this guy took his notes. Is there any way that folks can find, find that online or... You know, they can, I, can, I can certainly try and act as an intermediary so you don't have to give out your email address. But, uh, you know, how, how can folks get in touch maybe on social media? I, uh, I don't keep up with a lot of social media. I kind of took a hiatus for that in the last couple of years for many reasons. <laughs> yep. <laughs> kind of obvious reasons. But I do have an Instagram, which is uh, Inglefinger, I-N-G-L-E finger. Um, I occasionally update it. And it's not all drinks. There's a couple of different things, just experiences I have. If you want to look at my old tasting notes, I do have a WordPress site, which is Drams in Drinks. Yeah, Drams in Drinks. Uh, WordPress slash Drams and Drinks, I believe. If you go to WordPress and tr- type in Drams and Drinks, it'll come up. Yep, and we'll link to that on the show notes page. And uh, yeah, shout out, shout out to any of those um, those platforms that don't charge for for blogging and for websites. I think um, you know if if you want to you know publish a website, you know like my personal website, like the Modern Bar Cart website, with lots of features like e-commerce or like contact forms. That's great. But if you just want to take tasting notes, just go for a free WordPress blog or a free blogger blog or whatever the popular platforms are out there. There's literally no barrier to entry if you know how to type on a keyboard to starting your own um, like record keeping practice in the digital space. So definitely shout out to those platforms and uh, please visit us again uh, on the show notes page over at modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast to check out everything we've been talking about here on this episode. And uh, Sam, thanks so much for sharing all your experiences with us. Thank you again for having me. Cheers. Cheers. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and production assistance by Samantha Reed, home bartending insights by Sam Vieira, excellent food and cocktails courtesy of Guildhall in Burbank, California, and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2019.